stop sharing and turn it over to you. All right. Yeah. Th thanks, Aaron. And thanks, thanks, Leon. I appreciate the, the cheering section. That's nice. Um, and and just the, the witty banter at the beginning, just to kind of get things going. All right. So let me go ahead and share my screen and put this into, oh, yes. You're probably looking at yourself. So let's stop doing that. Okay, I can slideshow mode. Okay, can you see? Yeah, yep. see the deck. All right, rock on. So, um, so yeah. So the the idea behind this was just um, combining a couple passions, right? So I attended a OKR session at at an earlier SIG, and I was just thinking, you know, there's a lot of questions that people have around this topic, and there's a lot of interest, um, sort of as evidenced by the the, the good signups for tonight. So I wanted to combine these two and it was interesting. I, I think it's you, Beth, that was talking about some classes you have. So I, I'd love to compare notes sometime and see what you got, uh, see how this lines up. So yeah, Aaron and I worked together like 10 years ago. Um, this first time getting to put my credential down and I'm super excited about it. Yes, last year was apparently ended with new new branding for everybody. So but everyone in Coactive and everyone in ICF got brand new logos. Um, <laughs> so these are kind of the things that I do. Um, I was also on the Agile Austin board at one point. Um, so a little something to add. Uh, coaching is, is awesome. There, for me, like this has been a game changer. And so I, I just continue to read and immerse myself in, in these things. And one of the things I've really enjoyed was a new book called Simplifying Coaching. And in it, instead of talking about, so in my deck, you'll see reference to clients. She calls them thinkers. And I really like that quite a lot. It's giving people space to think. So I like this idea of helping thinkers think. And so I'll, I'll, I'll put some of that in the material tonight as we're talking through this. Interesting. So uh, the agenda for tonight, we're going to try to get through, well, we will get through the main four sections here and then kind of leave time at the end, as everyone said, for questions and answers. Um, we're going to lead off with a primer. So I, you know, I, I'm imagining there's a mix of experience and exposure to these topics. So I've got to at least kind of hit on what OKRs are and uh, a little bit around coaching. So let's dive into that. So uh, this is kind of the obligatory, like where did OKRs come from slide and a little bit of history. Um, I tried to add in a couple things that I thought maybe might not be covered in other slides. Uh, as most people have heard, Andy Grove was sort of the father of OKRs and a lot of his work um, defining these came in the 70s uh, in Intel. Uh, John Dewar, who is a more well-known name, uh, he's really popularized OKRs, learned from Andy in the 70s. Uh, and his book, Measure What Matters, that came out in two, 2017, referenced a lot of the work that he did when he introduced them to Google in 1999. In 2016, this was really the first time that, uh, that I learned about OKR, so I don't know about others, but for me, that was my first exposure. Uh, and I remember sitting at a table at the Agile conference, and I think it was in Atlanta, um, with, with Felipe Castro, didn't know who he was. He just kept going on and on about OKRs. I'm like, all right, let me check this out. Uh, and that was the first time that I remember uh, that topic coming up at an Agile conference. Um, today, it feels like there's a lot of products out there. And so that's kind of the big thing that I'm seeing right now is there's, everyone seems to have a, a product around OKRs. And what I like about putting that down there is there's lots of interesting ways that they're creating visuals and other things that can help people have discussions around this. Um, so I thought that was a significant thing to add here. So what is an OKR? Um, objective and key result. So the objective is just really a, OKRs are a goal setting technique, right? It's a goal setting framework. And so when we have these objectives, these are not our plans, they're goals. And the key results are, are measurements. There's some sort of, um, uh, some sort of evidence that we're achieving or progressing towards the goal. So quick example. 
So if we want to make digital payments more convenient, we might create a couple key results. First one, 80% reduction in time to complete payment. So that might be a little more convenient than the current experience. And then another one to make it more convenient might be to double the number of auto pay enrollments. And so now it's more convenient because you don't have to worry about paying. So if we look at this example, we have an objective at the top with the key results below. So the, the objective, we want something to be short, clear, and memorable. And for the key result, we want something quantifiable, something that provides evidence that you've met the goal and is outcome oriented. I'm, I'm guessing this group has probably heard or talked about shifting from sort of output to outcome for a long time. And so this, I find a good way to do it, but it's a lot easier to say it than to actually do it. I don't know if anyone's heard of uh, fast goals. I'm sure everyone's heard of SMART or a lot of you have heard of SMART. There's an article out there and this is in the references at the end called Fast Beats Smart. And so fast is distinguished from smart in that um, the frequently discussed, that was interesting. Hmm, <laughs> okay. Frequently discussed, ambitious, specific, and transparent. So the, the specific part shows up in SMART, but the other parts are really around um, creating a goal that's meaningful, that creates some kind of growth, right? This ambition is something not everyone necessarily agrees on when they do OKRs, but it does create um, the potential for real growth and learning. Um, transparent really talks more about the accountability that comes with this, the sharing, the alignment and other things. Um, and frequently discussed means don't just set it and forget it, right? So if we're gonna bother to make it visible, we're gonna make it ambitious and it's worth going after. It's probably something we wanna talk about to see um, how we're doing against it. So some benefits of OKRs, a few things. There are others, but for me, these are the top four. One, create some kind of focus. So many companies struggle with this. They, everything is a top priority. People can't agree. It could be because of their political stance or, or something that's particularly important to them. Um, and so companies have a hard time making decisions. Teams have a hard time making decisions. Um, so besides focus, alignment is something. Right, so if, if, two, if two groups have goals that are working at cross purposes, um, neither one might achieve their goals. And so just getting people to sort of agree on what these shared goals are uh, goes a long way. Growth, we, I mentioned growth and ambition. So if we really wanna get much better at something, we should stretch ourselves, we should push ourselves, right? To go to this new place. Um, for those of you that, that have coaching certifications or something else that you've obtained that was a lot of hard work, um, you know, when you signed up for it, you may have wondered what's, what's in, what does this entail? How many hours do I need to put into this? How easy is this going to be? I remember the first time I was on a zoom call and I was, I was learning to coach and I was having to do it in front of all these other people. And it was, I was scared, frankly, but it was an amazing moment. And from that, it became easier, uh, and easier in front to do it in front of other people. And I was able to really stretch myself. And then the last thing that I think OKRs can really do for you, you know, if you can invest in doing them well, is learning, right? So if we, if we create OKRs that support learning, there's a lot that can benefit us both in achievement of the OKRs, but also beyond that. All right, any questions about that before I move on? Okay. So let's hit coaching. I've just got a few slides on this, but, but thinking about OKRs and what they are and their benefits. I want to start with the systems perspective. So for those of you, so Aaron, I think on your slide, it said something about ORSC, right? And I, it, there may be some other people on the, on the phone or on the line that also uh, are familiar with it, but it's basically relationship systems coaching. So this notion of coaching a system is that a system is made up of a group of people uh, often working towards some kind of shared purpose or some shared identity. And that the people in the system, each person represents some perspective, but the perspective is not theirs alone, it belongs to the system. 
each voice is a voice of the system. And when you're coaching, whether you're coaching OKRs or, or some other way with a large group, the system is the client. So it's not about one person or another person. Um, so if somebody is saying something and, and you, you sense some kind of resistance, that's a voice in the system. If somebody is moving forward with this, they're embracing it and they're having success, that's another voice in the system. And the system or the client um, is creative, resourceful and whole. So this is, this is a kind of a huge deal when you can actually shift to believing that the people you work with, whether it's a person or a system, a group of people are creative, resourceful and whole, you kind of shift the way you work with them, right? You're not there to have all the answers and be the expert. Yes, you can shift into consulting and you don't want to frust frustrate people by not giving them answers to basic things. But ultimately these people need to um, be able to own this themselves. It needs to be sustainable change. All right, so one disclaimer on this. So systems contain real humans and relationships and it gets a little messy sometimes. So while OKR is at a surface level, super easy, you know, to, to learn how to do, there's a lot of backdrop that goes into all this and a lot of people come with real human emotions and relationships and other things. So also borrowing from, from Orsk, and this will be my first time to try to use the pen. So let's see how well this works. No one else sees the pen, just me, it's my pen. All right. <laughs> so there's this concept of edges. So if you read the quote here, you're gonna cross an edge every time you're used to doing something a certain way, or you have a certain identity and you're asked to do something new. So you're in your primary identity, you're working towards your second one. I am gonna just tell you everything about OKR it kind of fits into this little bucket here. So you're gonna have some people that are gonna be like, you know what, I'm a product owner, I'm a product manager, and I am super excited about this because I'm having a hard time with priorities. I'm having a hard time with my stakeholders. I'm competing for resources, whatever, whatever they're saying. And so they may find themselves kind of over here. So if you've crossed the edge and you're kind of getting comfortable in this new identity, you may appear over here. You may have another person that's like, yeah, you know, that sounds like a pretty good idea. I think, I think I'm ready to try that. I'm not quite sure at it, but uh, sure about it, but I don't have a lot of reservations, right? So this is kind of a nice place to be because when you're crossing an edge, you wanna cross at the shortest possible point. Now, you're gonna have some people that are gonna be down here and that's okay. They're gonna be there for a reason. They have a different experience, a different background than the others, right? And you might have some people over here. So your system's gonna be made up of, of people that are embracing the change, people that are not quite ready for the change, and you've got to work with all of them. All right, so a little bit about coaching. Now, for those of you that are, you know, experts in coaching, you're certified in coaching, you're gonna know all this stuff. But coaching is first and foremost, future focused. So the more you can get people to kind of get into that space and focus on on what's possible, uh, the better your outcomes could be. Also, you're there to help increase awareness. So it's not just about, let's just race forward and put down some goals on paper. I don't have time for any more than this. We just need to get this done, check the box, and move on. There's actually a lot that you can learn and become aware of through coaching and through coaching and OKRs um, that can create new dynamics for you, helpful dynamics. When you're coaching, so sometimes I think coaching gets a bad rap. And so you'll, um, you'll hear people go, uh, what's the term they use? Basically, they don't want you to just kind of sit there and ask them questions because they, they don't, they don't actually believe you're going to challenge them or offer anything of value. And so, when, when I talk about coaching, I let people know, you know, if they're looking for a challenge, they're definitely going to get it, but they're also going to get support, right? So it's coaching is kind of equal parts support and challenge. 
to hope, hopefully get people uh, increasing awareness and moving towards growth, right? Towards the future that they want. Um, some other things that are helpful in OKR, being curious, uh, acknowledging progress, right? Especially as you're kind of recognizing edges and offering them the power to choose. So some of these things are gonna come up as, as we kind of move into the rest. So I had this idea and we'll see if it's any good. So the, so ICF, I imagine Coactive, probably others have this concept of coaching competencies. And I found it hugely useful to have these as places with markers that I could either exhibit or not exhibit to know how I was doing. Maybe I was strong in other areas, maybe weak in others. And so I thought, what, what would that look like um, for OKRs? Uh, Norma wants to get into the room, by the way. There you go. <laughs> um, so a couple things. Coach helps the client explore the motivation for change. So here we're like, okay, I just want to check the box. That could be an indication that maybe the leaders actually don't know why they're doing OKRs or haven't communicated out to people um, what the reason is behind it or the benefits they want to get. Coach supports the client's awareness and shift towards outcomes. So here they might be discovering what is an outcome? How is it different than what I normally do? What would it look like to be in that space? Coach enables the client to identify measures of success. So what would success look like? How do I measure it? I might, I might be used to certain ways of measuring or not measuring, or I may think that you, you might not be able to measure that at all. So there's a lot that goes into this one. The coach invites the client to design methods of accountability. So this isn't just like a set and forget, we're gonna create this OKR at the beginning of the quarter. Three months later, we'll come back and yeah, I hope we got it, right? So that's not what we're looking for here. Um, so we want, we want the, the goal setting to be meaningful, to be helpful, right? To achieve that growth. The coach partners with the client to explore the systemic impact. So if you, if you introduce OKRs and you work towards these goals, What's gonna happen? What, how's the rest of the organization gonna react? What are we gonna to need to be successful with this? And then um, last but not least, coach encourages the client to find opportunities for frequent learning and decisions. So six coaching competencies. And so we're gonna hit these as we move on. So we've got basically three areas I wanna hit as we look at coaching OKRs. The first one is generating objectives. So like, where do OKRs come from? Um, Mark, so before this... you get too deep into this really quickly, we've got a question over the ch in the chat. Yeah. Christine is asking about a measure of success example, you know, the design slide. Why is there yeah. an elbow noodle in the lower left corner? I don't understand. Why is there, why is there... <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> So this is the magic of PowerPoint and the PowerPoint uh, styles. So yes, they have a macaroni noodle there. <laughs> okay. That's a real question. That's awesome. All right. Any others? Um, I think we're good. Keep going. Okay. You know, if you see some stray things, that's likely what they are. You might notice a cone over there in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I borrow from PowerPoint a lot. Uh, okay, so first thing on generating objectives. So let's say you're coming in, you got a whole bunch of people, they're like, all right, who cares? Let's go, let's do this. Uh, generally, they're not going to stop what they're doing to create some grand vision of where they want to go, and they're going to throw all their current plans and work away. That's not going to happen. So what I like to do is help them, so meet them where they are, and help them mine OKRs from their features and initiatives. Right, so Lean Startup was popular for talking about validated learning, right? And so often there are projects and initiatives that say, okay, uh, here's why this is gonna be super awesome. Give us the budget, right? So they do that, they make the case, and then they go ship it. Quite often they do not go back and look later, did we hit the goals? So this just kind of helps you, whether they're features for a quarter, or something longer term for an initiative, it's a good place to start. So here, 
you might ask some questions. What problems are you solving? So they'll come with their list of features. They'll come with their initiative. You can ask what problems they're solving. How would you know this worked was successful? And what would be a big win? So you're entering the conversation with some very concrete work and you're working backwards from that, trying to extrapolate the value from it. Second idea, find perspective outside in. So here, maybe they are looking a little further down the road. So if we start outside, we're gonna look at, you know, what are customers saying? What are they needing? What are the stakeholders needing? Right, what is the company, the direction? What are the market changes? Like I can guarantee you that Zoom and uh, Miro and Mural, they, they weren't quite as popular about a year ago. Um, so the market changes for them were a pretty big deal. And I, I guarantee you they had some big goals to claim all that, mar that new market. And then environmental demand. So I'm not gonna bring up the one that nobody wants to talk about, but there are certainly things in the world that can happen that may influence what you see as a goal. And then maybe you're not ready for outside, right? You might actually wanna look inside. So here you might look at operational excellence, right? Like we're too slow or we wanna release more often or we have quality issues and you have big gaps and things. Maybe we wanna create a new technology platform or um, commercialize an API, who knows? So Mark, uh, before you go any further, yeah. um, there is another question coming in over the chat. Sure. You know, these are examples of qualitative um, you've, examples you've given here. How yeah, do you sure. influence those business stakeholders when the data you have upfront is qualitative rather than quantitative? And Meru is saying by using OKRs, Christina, um, the key results is for that. But do you want to embellish on that at all? So the question is, how do you how do you influence the selection of OKRs if all those, you have? How do you influence those business stakeholders when the data you have up front is qualitative rather than quantitative? <laughs> Depends. Um, so that, 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 that's a bit of a tough one to answer. I, I guess you got to dig in a little bit to that. So um, what do people need to hear that convinces them that they need to change, right? So if there are, I mean, qualitative and quantitative kind of go hand in hand. You sort of need a mix of the two. So if people need evidence of something, then a lot of times they are going to need um, some kind of numbers around that. And so it just depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about customers and they, they say, well, I've talked to a bunch of customers and the customers are saying X, Y, Z. So that's kind of qualitative and anecdotal. If you have an NPS score that sort of back that up or, or some kind of um, a retention score, something like that, those things can supplement the narrative that you've got. Is this along the lines of, of your question? Sherry is also asking, will you give an example of an OKR that is qualitative? Asking who? Uh, Sherry is asking you if you will okay. give an example of an OKR that is qualitative. So what, yes and no. So in, I have examples of OKRs in this. And so what you're gonna find is the objective is gonna be qualitative and the key results are gonna be quantitative. And so maybe as we hit some of those, uh, we, can see, we can see if any of that's helping. Okay. And if by the time we get to the end, if you figure out that, that you either have a different question or you have the same question, maybe we can hit it then. Perfect, that work? And I'm seeing responses in the chat that thumbs up, let's wait. Yeah, good. Okay, all right, cool, thanks. So a common question I get is what the heck is the difference between OKRs and KPIs? In fact, that came up during the session that Aaron, that you hosted over the summer. So I put the slide here for what it's worth. Um, some people think they're the same thing. Some people think metrics and OKRs are the same thing. Um, 
I like to draw a distinction for me. KPIs are like, am I healthy or not? So like, I generally don't, I'm not looking to have goals around my temperature uh, or whether I'm, you know, congested or not. I just expect that those things are fine. But if I start to feel a little warm and a little run down, uh, then I may have an issue that I need to address, right? Or some long-term health concerns. But here, you know, if, if your quality is good, you don't need an OKR around. But if you would want to know if it dips. And so KPIs are going to be fairly constant. You're always going to be looking at those, but you're not always going to have big efforts to act on them to close some huge gap, right? Or to uh, grow in some particular way. Where OKRs are going to be future focused, something big you want to go do, right? Something ambitious. If that distinction makes sense. Okay, I've seen some thumbs, some head nodding, cool. So here's an example, right? So you may have like net promoter score quality, mean time to resolution. The low red band actually means the score is low. So in this case, if the score is below some threshold, maybe it is important enough to go create an OKR around. But only things that have really big gaps that are KPIs may be worth transitioning to an OKR. So hopefully that kind of is consistent with your view, if you already have a view on it, or is clear for those that this concept is new. All right, another another option here. So this one comes straight out of coaching. So if you're whether you're working with an individual or whether you're working with a group, sometimes you've got to get them out of the space that they're in right now because otherwise they cannot move past it. All right. So they're they're kind of stuck where they are and they cannot see somewhere else. So Getting people to kind of set a vision of where they want to go that might be a little further out is a really good technique. And it's not always easy because not, not everyone has patience to kind of do this sort of thing. They feel like the goal setting should be a little more rote, a little faster. But if you really want to grow, you really want to stretch, get people to, vision, uh, to envision what the future could look like. What are some possibilities? and get them to sit in that space, right? So here you might be doing some kind of role play. You may have some kind of floor cards with a group and get them to take a different perspective. The stake, they, maybe they're the stakeholders, maybe they're the team, maybe they're the customers. What would things look like if you make this big change you're hoping to make? If you have this um, vision for the future, what would it be like to be in that? And if you can actually get yourself into that space, you may get energized by that. You may see some possibilities you hadn't thought of before, right? You may open your mind and get in this kind of creative space that you weren't in by just thinking about the work you've got to do now. And so this works really well with individual coaching sessions uh, and it can work likewise when you're trying to figure out what objectives to pick. Okay, another way to generate objectives is look at other ones. So in this case, we look at something like bi-directional alignment. We might have some annual corporate goals and then we're trying to figure out well, what, what are our quarterly product goals? So this can work in either direction. We can either say, hey, you know, over here, we've got this goal. I've got some work I was already thinking about that kind of lines up with that. So I might create my own goal and I want it to support this one, right? Or I'm down here and I've got an idea for this great product goal. And I don't, I don't exactly see it reflected in some of the key results here, but I think there's an opportunity or maybe there's an opportunity to create a new annual corporate goal. There could be a discussion between them that sort of influences the creation or the refinement of that objective. At some point you've got enough objectives. So one of the things I see so OKRs can have lots of different settings. So I'm going to give you an example. So one of the settings where I've used OKRs was with a group doing lean portfolio management. So this is a group of executives. Each of the executives has their own area. They all have a bunch of people reporting to them. And they had a difficult time reducing the number of OKRs. Anyone want to guess why? Competing objectives. Because everything was important. Everything. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a few, it's it's a bit of that, right? So it is a bit of like hard time making a decision because they all seem important. The other part was really around their identity. So each of these groups were organized around doing something particularly well. They wanted to see their own groups, their own departments work reflected in the OKRs. And they felt that if they didn't line up to that, they may not be representing the work they're doing, their work, their area may seem less important and that kind of feels like a threat. So there are lots of reasons why um, people are gonna have a hard time reducing objectives, but a lot of it tends to be around how they're perceived and their worth. And some of it's gonna be about, they feel like they need to reflect all the work they're doing, which isn't really the point. So what can you do? Uh, one option is scarcity. If you knew you could only accomplish one, which would it be? And I like this one because what seems to resonate with people is they know something's going to come up that's unexpected while they're working on this. And so because that they can feel that, and it's happened to them many, many times, you could basically bring that up and say, look, if something unexpected comes along, I, you know, I know it couldn't possibly, and then you bring up kind of whatever example, or they bring up an example, which one of these are you going to focus on? Another option is maybe they have, so that group we were working with, they had a bunch of stakeholders. So they were a shared service that these execs worked under and they, their stakeholders were other lines of business. So this is a huge company, other lines of business. And part of their goal with OKRs was to improve their relationship with their stakeholders by really working on the things that matter to them. So Part of us working on reducing them was, you know, which of these would pick stakeholder, pick your stakeholders, say is mo most important, right? So blank could be customer, blank could be stakeholders, whatever. So shift your perspective to try to figure out which one you would pick. Now, quite often, they're not going to be able to reduce this. So at a bare minimum, rank them. How would you order these by importance? Because they're, ha they're hanging on to these, right? Having this many is serving some kind of purpose for them. So don't try to take it away, just help them rank it. And usually they'll come to some kind of consensus and agreement. Okay, so that's the section on generating objectives. So now we're gonna shift into authoring objectives. So here you're going to see some examples of objectives and key results. So I have spent a ridiculous amount of time over the last three months, especially um, like multiple times a day, uh, many days a week, working with people that are authoring OKRs. And for most people, this is a new practice. So, oh, so before I go into this, so one, one of my reasons for creating this deck and, and trying to kind of move this forward is to create more people that can go do this because we're trying to roll this out at a, at a huge company. And I'm sure there's lots of others out there that want to do the same. And I want them to be able to do more of this on their own. So I want to teach them how to fish, not catch the fish. So one of the things that people uh, ask for, and I want them to be able to have the conversations that I'm having with them with each other. So objectives are qualitative. And so I've got basically three categories they can fall into. Limiting. So if I'm working with a group and they're, they're refining their OKR, if it's still sitting in limiting, I want to try to help them pass that. If it's in helpful, it's basically good enough. And I rarely see awesome, but they're, if they're already in helpful, I'll challenge them a bit to see if they can make it better. So we're going to see a few things few examples of these, um, but I'll highlight a couple on this. So a compound objective would be something like, um, <laughs> I'm going to date myself, but back, back when Saturday Night Live was new, um, there was a skit that Dan Aykroyd did, and he, 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 he basically did a commercial. 
and he said, it's a floor wax, it's a dessert topping and add something else in here. Sometimes the objectives look like that. It's A, it's B, it's C. And actually you find this in coaching too. They'll list a bunch of things and you say kind of which one, which one of these is most important to you. You give the client a choice and you kind of move on. So when the objective lists all those things, you ask them that question and you try to narrow it down. Because if it's unfocused, it's not really gonna help. The one that says out of bounds is like, if you've got a quarterly OKR and they're telling you that it can't be achieved for a year, it's probably not right sized. No, this happens. So <laughs> this happens all the time. Um, it's very frequent. So here's an example, right? Make digital payments fast, secure, easy to sign up for while delivering quality. There's a lot in this, right? Notice the commas, it's a dead giveaway. So we could certainly ask some questions around this one. Um, I noticed you're, you're talking about fast, secure and easy. Which one of these is, you know, which one of these is most important? Or maybe that's not the question. Maybe the question is, how would you summarize this, right? What bottom line this for me? What does that look like? And then the for while, while delivering with quality, that seems to be sort of a footnote, not the main story, not the headline. And so there's an opportunity later to kind of tease some of these things out potentially as key results. And so maybe if they're having a hard time getting rid of it, you start to tell them that, well, these, these look like they might be good key results. How would we summarize this objective? So I would, I would put this one in the limiting camp. So here's another one. Up our OKR game so we can stop building the wrong things faster. What do you think of that one? That's a, this, is a, this is a real one. And all I did was change the word R instead of something that was very proprietary. I, I wouldn't Somebody have, actually came up with this in the last week. I wouldn't have <laughs> so what do you think? I, I heard this kind of objectives being given to managers the whole time when I was a consultant. Um, exactly formulated almost the same. Um, we've got to stop doing this and do this new thing and much faster. Go do it. Well, so... So what you're describing doesn't sound like it's necessarily awesome, but I think in this case, it does, it does fall into the spirit of what you might be after with OKRs as a benefit. So I'm okay with it. Uh, and I like that it's short. And so it's kind of like eh, it's somewhere in the middle of like helpful because it's concise and it's distinct. And for this, this is a set of coaches within an organization that was trying to roll out OKRs. And so this for them was actually their, their headline. So they came up with it themselves. So it doesn't have that kind of give it to somebody, you know, mentality. All right, last one. Deliver data-driven insights by introducing abilities to track metrics for business performance. What do you think? I like that one. All right. Uh, I, would, I would call out the word buy. So that one's, that one's a bit of a clue. Um, but even with something like this, you can sort of, you can be curious, you can be interested, tell me more about that, right? I see you're saying uh, by doing that, say more about it. Eventually you are gonna wanna take the buy part out, but when they include these kinds of hints, they're great for dialogue. They're great for learning more. Um, and, and as they tell you more things, it's so much easier to help them. So you look for hints, both in terms of what to take out but also what to learn more about. Is this making sense? Is it helpful? <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Same kind of thing now with key results. Lists are a little bit longer because we see more things going on. So in the limiting output, you're gonna see that one the most often. Maybe you already do. I don't know how many people are actually working with it. Compound, same kind of thing. Qualitative, so we don't, here we don't want qualitative, so I don't know if that helps with the answer earlier, but um, here it's a little less helpful. Uh, other things here, um, let me just see. Helpful would be like, you've got a good looking OKR and you're gonna start hitting it. Maybe it's not quite aspirational and ambitious, 
that's okay as a starting point. A lot of places that might actually be a win to hit your goal. And so let them do it. Um, interesting. I feel like I miss, uh, hold on. So yeah, all right. Um, what else? I think the other thing here is having a baseline is, is kind of useful because you can see where you're coming from. And then leading indicators. So most people are probably familiar with leading and lagging indicators. I, I like having a couple leading in there as long as we don't end up with too many key results because this is where the learning comes in. Otherwise everything is just too late. And so how do you know along the way what to adjust and what to inspect and adapt on? So when we work with key results, this is a, a lot of where the limiting beliefs come in. So in coaching, we talk about limiting beliefs. There is a fantastic book out there called Laser Focus. I think it's the heart of laser focus coaching. This book came out last year. It was another one that was very influential to me. I, I changed the way I coach the minute I read that uh, and it worked out. So here are some of the things you're gonna see people say or believe. We cannot measure that. There's no way. We cannot correlate the results to our work or the variant of that, we cannot correlate the results of, to our work alone. So this could be the dependency thing coming up. We will not get any value until all the work is done. All right, so here you're probably hitting somebody that's working in longer cycles. Maybe they're not quite agile yet, but they wanna use OKRs, you're gonna hit a mix. We will not change what we're doing, what's the point? So you're gonna, you're gonna hit skeptics, um, you're going you're gonna to have people sort of wondering where the value is. So go in expecting those things and then meet people where they are and work with them. Oh, yes. And another good one. So our worth is based on what we include in our OKR. So here they're going to want to pack in everything they're doing and or in some cases, uh, performance management may come into their mind. They may be worried that their compensation and their annual review or whatever review cycle they're working on is tied to this thing. And that's gonna impact the way they work with you on OKRs. So all of these are, are pretty important. So let's hit an example. Complete a successful pilot, implement new accounting procedures and create a baseline. I see this one all the time. Create a baseline to measure the time it takes to accomplish task X. How do these look as key results? What do you think? Anyone? They're not measurable. Right. There's no numbers. What's, yeah, what defines success? Objective, yeah. Right, so, but here's the thing. We want to acknowledge that they have put work into this. We want to be curious. We want to appreciate the work that they put into this. This is a new thing for them. So we do not want to call attention to the, oh, this is all wrong, right? right. So we, we want to meet them where they are. We want to thank them for putting this. We want to be curious. So what would a successful pilot look like? How would you know it was successful, right? Tell me about these new accounting procedures. What problem are you gonna solve with this? Or what, how will it be different than what they do today? And then my favorite is to create the baseline. I seriously, I see this almost every week. This is where they're like, we can't measure this. And so what I tell them is, what would you want the standard to be? What standard do you want to set? And then let's get some measurement and work towards that standard. So you set the standard. It's okay, you don't have measurements. Or in the, it could be, they think they have to go do a lot of data collection. It has to be terribly precise and perfect. I'm like, this, is, this doesn't have to be perfect. Any, anything you know, even a few data points could be helpful. So here I'd say this is limiting, it needs a little work. But again, if we work with the folks in the right way, if we recognize this is new for them, we recognize this is what they've always done, right? They're, they're coming across an edge, do it the right way. Learn about it, be interested and help them along. What about this one? What do you think, any better? Same? As the what, but not the how. 
No, because it reduces headcount by 40%. Yeah, there's a bunch going on here. So I tried to pack a whole lot of things into a couple examples because there's just so much out there and I didn't want to just exhaust you with all that. But what you'll notice here, so the headcount one, this comes up too. This is a pattern, okay? And it, it's okay that it comes up, but I think we want to shift that to, you have people, they are part of your company, there's lots of things they're doing today that maybe you don't see those things as valuable and you'd like to automate those or whatever. What opportunities does that, does that create? What else could be possible that folks could do to bring value other than what they're doing today? So I, I, I do sometimes use that as a shift because what's happening around OKR is if it's seen as negative, if it's seen as threatening, it's not gonna take hold. It's just not gonna happen. Um, the one at the end talks about the how, the one at the top may or may not be easily attributable to your work. If it's not easily attributable to your work, like lots of other things besides our area could influence net promoter score, then it's probably too broad and you're not sure if the work you do is actually influencing the number. Does that make sense? Okay. So this one still needs a little work, but I like that it had some numbers in it. The last one was also a little compound too. So I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. I know we've got nine minutes left. So here is an example of a good one and it's, it's one I've shown before. So notice the numbers are at the bottom and the key results and the objective is always qualitative. Anyone heard of roof shots and moon shots? Yes. This is also this is also PowerPoint graphics. So if you think that looks like a cookie or a bowling ball, it's a moon. <laughs> okay. So moon shots are aspirational, roof shots are are what we call committed, right? And so, you know, people are going to be where they're going to be, meet them halfway. Um, support and challenge, support and challenge. Where are you today? We never hit our goals. We're always and people are always yelling at us. Okay, maybe you need some committed goals, right? Or Oh, we, we always hit it or, or, or we're close, but our competition is kicking our butt, right? Or we, 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 need to, we need to step up our game. So maybe you need a moonshot. The confidence levels, if, you, if you're familiar with Christina Watke's book, Radical Focus, she talks about a confidence level of five out of 10, which is 50% confidence. We 50-50 shot, we're going to hit this. I love that for aspirational. I love it um, because that, that is where real growth happens. So if people are gonna get penalized for that, they're never gonna sign up for it. So moving along, let's say we had an aspirational goal. We got a 50-50 shot to get it. What do you think would be considered success? What should we consider a success at the end? They're going for this goal. They had a 50-50 shot in the beginning. We're now at the end. Should they have achieved the entire goal? See a head nod, no. Where should they get? What do you think? What looks like good? I think 70, 80 is looking really good. Okay. All right, yeah. So, so generally we'd say 70, 70 or more. Looks about right. There's a lot more you can look at just besides numbers. You may have set something out here and you achieve something here, but it had the effect you wanted. And if you observe that and you go, you know what, they're way more productive and like, we don't have to do anymore, we're done. That, that's a fine answer too. With committed, we are probably looking here. Mark, could you address um, what makes yeah. uh, you say 70? And there were some questions about, you know, what is safe, what is committed there as well. So if you could dig a little bit more into that, I think people would appreciate it. Sure. Um, what is seven? So, so if you're going towards a goal, let's say the number was to double something, right? So we start at 50 and double that would be a hundred. I'm not good enough at math, but um, <laughs> so, let's see. 50% uh, of that would be 75. And then let's see, another 25% is what, like 88 or something. So if we hit, if we had 50, 50 people enrolled in auto pay, we're going for a hundred and we hit 88, we'd say that's pretty good. That's 70% of the number you were trying to hit. 
So for something that's aspirational, where it's like a big stretch, it's hard. You got a 50, 50 shot. You tell yourself um, when you sign up for this, that's what we mean by 70%. If you say, you know, the bar's pretty low on this other goal and we're, we're really confident we could hit it. We might be like 90% confident or hundred percent confident we could hit it. Then you want to achieve all of the goals. So if the goal again was double and you were going from 50 to hundred people auto enrolled, then you want to be at hundred. So hundred percent in this case would mean that you got to the count of 100. Does that help? Mike is saying he's still having some trouble chewing on this. Okay, um, I'm looking at the time and we have one more section. Is this something we could circle back to? And I can, yeah, yeah okay, let's circle back and see if we can hit this in the q and I'm laughing because and, uh, Leon's and I'm also gonna take this as like feedback. Yeah, I, I can also take this as feedback. Um, but there's another slide that kind of hits this a little bit. So maybe that other slide might be better or more confusing, but we'll find out. <laughs> All right, so we talked about generating objectives. We talked about authoring them. There are some strategies that I kind of hinted on a little bit. So one is to normalize. So people are going to make all these, they're going to do all these things, these patterns I showed you. That's okay. Tell them it's okay. Tell them this is very common. I see this all the time, right? Make it okay for them to have made this, um, this version of an OKR. Two, anything great they're bringing, they may actually be telling you for a while, right at the beginning, a bunch of narrative around this thing. Acknowledge that that was really insightful, right? And this is gonna be really helpful to work into it, like build them up, create positivity and confidence. Listen and be curious, right? So all those hints of things that you might wanna adjust, there are also things to ask about. And then look for patterns, notice things. So if you see a pattern where um, they don't think they can ever hit this goal or this goal isn't measurable, that might tell you how to act with them. So the last section is um, what do you do with this thing after you're done? So we've written this OKR, okay, great. Put it on the shelf, we'll come back three months later. Wrong answer. So I'll put some other things here. I'm gonna kind of fly through these a little bit, but it's very common that people are gonna be at different places and that's okay. So I put this together with the idea that it's, it's okay to be at different points. So very, common, people are going to have OKRs, but they're not going to be using them to affect how they work. That's fine. We'll call that crawl. Way over on the other side of, is fly. They're ambitious. They're meaningful. People are, all the work is centered around achieving them. Awesome. Right. And the other things are somewhere in between. Taking that a step further, we can look at certain dimensions, ambition, planning, focus, accountability, learning. Right. So we might say, well, the, the group you know, might be here, they're reviewing monthly to check for progress, but they're not quite here because they're not reflecting and acting on them, right? So what they might do instead is they might be doing their learning quarterly, even though they're checking progress monthly. So they might actually be in multiple of these areas. And what's helpful about this kind of thing is not to judge somebody, but for those that are in one spot, you let them know, well, you're actually over here in another spot. So this is great or that this is a normal path that you would walk. Or if they're over here, right? Maybe they're wondering what's next. And if you tell them some of the stuff out here, they might go, oh, that's awesome. I didn't even realize that was a possibility. And they may start working for that. All right, so we're gonna try this again from the top, this time with feeling. <laughs> so imagine we are at the beginning. That's what this little marker is. Again, Google art, or uh, sorry, PowerPoint art. So we're at the beginning, our baseline is whatever. So this top half is just this. So above this line is 80% reduction. If we we're at five minutes, we would like to be at one minute. Make sense? Okay, down here, double the number of accounts enrolled in autopay. We're at 100, we wanna be at 200. If I'd remember that earlier, I would have said those numbers instead of 50 and 100. Oh, that's interesting. Oh yeah, okay. So here's the deal. You create your OKRs. 
generate ideas from them. What ideas do we think could help us and place your bet? So we wanna generate ideas. We don't need a million ideas, we just need a few. Place a bet. So this is kind of a different way of thinking about backlogs. We're not, it's not just this fixed set of things we're all gonna do. Not that backlogs are, but a lot of times that's what people think. In this case, we're gonna look at things and how they kind of tie up to these, these key results. And which one do we think is gonna help us get there the soonest or make the biggest impact? So now we come back to the slide and we're at this point in time. So now this is time. We are at this point. So we've got, we're about a quarter, a third of the way through the quarter, let's just say. So it's a three month period. We are one month in. So here we are one month into trying to achieve these goals. Ooh, sorry about that. I just gave it all away. Um, so we are at two and a half minutes and we're going to one minute and we just have- keep going. Just keep going, huh? You're fine. You're fine, just keep going. Yeah, uh, okay. So if we are halfway through our goal, how confident are you feeling at this point? Feel like they're gonna hit it? Look like pretty good progress. And what about the one below? The one below, a little less movement, 125. So the other thing we like to mix in here is confidence. Take confidence at different points and have a discussion about that. So coach the teams to work through this. If they're 80% confident, even though they didn't make a lot of progress, they may have learned something that would help them know how they're gonna get through the rest of it. But there or could also may... be there could also be dependencies, right? Because <clears throat> you could have team members changing. So just when they get their their flow, right? Because I mean, yeah. if you're looking at the top group, totally. You could say, oh yeah, they're two and a half. Oh well, I thought <clears throat> I read that as twenty five seconds. So say it was twenty five seconds for a second. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you know, if you kept the same team, then yeah, they would have a much higher um, rate. But if not, if the team was changing, then there'd be less of a chance. Yeah, so, so this one had a drop in confidence. So this went from 50 down to 30, even though we made a lot of progress. And so that could have been team members change. It could have been something that they learned that made, that made it seem it's impossible to get here. So these things together are quantitative and you mix some qualitative in to learn about what's going on. So this is where the learning piece comes in. So Aaron, quick check on you. I've got two more slides and then keep going, done. Keep going. Yeah, keep okay. And by two, I mean, okay. <laughs> so here, based on what we see, we may place our bet somewhere else, or we might just say, you know what? This isn't possible, right? Why invest more money in it? We do want people making decisions, whatever those decisions happen to be, whether it's place a bet on a different, different item, whether it's don't go after this anymore because we just realized we can't hit it. So maybe there's something now more important to do. The last piece on here before I give you kind of a, what I, for me is a warning, but it, it, it could be a philosophical discussion. So along the way, there should be points of reflecting and adjusting and learning. How did things go? What did you learn? Where was the growth? So there are lots of questions, right? You can be curious and ask with your own group as you're moving along with this. And when you're sharing this out, the same kinds of things can be shared. If you look backwards and you say, well, if we went back to the beginning, would, would we define this any different? This now helps you kind of think about the next one you're gonna define and how this learning could help you influence how you create your next objectives and key results. And then the last part, kind of like a sprint review, is you'll look ahead. Here are our next set of goals, share those out. And you start it all over again. Okay, last, last real slide. There's a great article. It's a Harvard Business Review article by Jeff Gotthelf, the author of Lean UX and many other good books. Uh, he's pretty well known in the Agile community. Uh, he's got a great article, but um, OKRs are a team game. Please separate individual performance reviews from compensation. These are two different things. If you tie them together, you're not gonna get ambitious goals. You're not gonna get huge growth. Um, people often, especially like they're rolling out OKRs and then they do this too, because they're looking for something better than what they have. 
take your time, find something better than what you have, but don't, don't conflate them because it's going to cause a lot of problems. So, oh yes, right. So use CFRs instead, which is conversations, feedback, recognition. You can have a whole talk on this. So I'm not going to get into a whole lot of it. Um, a few things, thoughtful change management, coach for sustainability, make things safe, create energy, incitement, and work on their confidence. Remember that they're crossing edges. And that's my talk and thank you. So Mark, um, really great. We're seeing you know a lot more chat tonight uh, than we have in a long time. So if anybody has questions for Mark, uh, please uh, bring them up now. As you can see, he's very approachable, willing to ask, answer, think about it, and has lots of great um, well, resources right here as well. Yeah. Yep. And one more thing before the questions come. If, if you could post that link, Aaron. Okay, hold on. Chat. I would love now. some feedback. You can, of course, give it to me now, but I'd love to just get it captured, look at it later. So um, I posted a Google link in uh, the chat, and it's a quick four-question survey. Uh, yeah, it's Mark just four questions. Sending out. Yeah. Um, and that really, he does really mean four, it's not five. Um, yeah, there's no personal questions. It's just like, rate this, rate me. What right. would made it, made it better? What are you interested in? Right. That's it. So four questions. And this is just to, you know, give Mark some help uh, on yep. this. Yeah, because this was a topic that we've, you know, we needed some, he did a great job of combining uh, OKRs, but the coaching around it. Um, so yeah. Yeah, Mark. Mark did this one as a personal favor to me and I deeply appreciate that he did. So, yeah. Sure. So if you guys have questions, shout them out. Yeah, I have a quick Please question. Please, Heidi. Awesome. Uh, Mark, first of all, thank you so much for uh, your time this evening and for presenting today. This has been really- Sure. Okay, it's been confusing to me for forever. So this has been so helpful. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on that uh, we just got to here at the very end is the differentiation between OKRs and personal performance goals. Uh -huh. uh, that's, that's something I hadn't really realized before. I feel like my clients have tried to use OKRs as their performance management system before. So would love to hear a little bit more from you there around kind of what the difference is there. Oof. <laughs> yeah, another you, you really have to pick the hardest one out of all Sorry, of them. Sorry, just kidding, just kidding. That's yeah. not my question. <laughs> So um, I kind of like, I'd be happy to tee up another talk around this. I have a lot of thoughts around this and how to deal with it. Um, I'll give you a little bit. And then maybe if you want to reach out, I'd be happy to talk more after. I just know we're short on time. So yeah. let me not cop out completely and give you something. So um, there's a few things. If you want to, shared goals are really important. If you want to create some kind of teamness, whether it's an organization, a company, or, or a single team or multi-team initiatives, shared goals are everything, meaningful shared goals. I have just found that they're huge to have people galvanized around something um, and having this higher purpose. If, if you're familiar with Daniel Pink's work at all, the, um, he talks about intrinsic, intrinsic motivators, and I, I have latched onto that ever since. So he talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so for me, OKRs really create that, that shared purpose. And I don't want to have individual goals that might conflict or get in the way of achieving bigger shared goals. And so I, I, I'm optimizing for the, the teams and the org and the company. And I feel that, and this is a fairly personal stance, I guess, um, people, there's certain things you're gonna want, right? So if, if you're running an org and you got people reporting to you, there's certain behaviors they're looking for. And I don't know that by putting them down as goals, you're necessarily gonna be working on them. For me, that's more around regular one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, giving them feedback about what you're seeing and working towards changing the behavior, which is far more regular than any kind of annual goal setting, or even if it's quarterly goal setting. So if, you want, if you want to influence real change and real growth, it's gotta be more more constant and more frequent. And I don't find that the performance reviews are the way to get there. Um, so whether it's accentuating positive behavior or curbing negative, you can certainly talk about how in the one-on-ones, how they're working towards those goals. Um, they can have things that they show about how they work towards them. 
that maybe it was above and beyond that you notice and you could recognize and they could get some satisfaction out of that. And you could certainly notice people that are taking on more responsibilities than they normally would and compensate them for them. But I don't want those written down as goals. Um, you're gonna find it's gonna be more of a limiting factor than a helpful factor. And that's probably as much as I can, I can say without being able to fill some more questions. Mark, we've got a couple of other questions over in the chat. Uh, Kathleen is saying, that's my question, how to address silos when we want to align towards shared goals and interdependencies. And then Christina also has a question about what about the fact that goals are usually related to upper management reaching some kind of target that kills. I feel okay. like we could spin up a separate subgroup called, you know, deep right. chats. And we'll video those and make them fully available. You know, that's well, in our spare time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned edges for a reason, right? So you're kind of putting these into the context of, of some things that might be going on. Um, mm -hmm. Can you repeat the first question and, and then sure. hold the second one? Because I, I sure. my memory is not that great. From Kathleen, uh, she says, that's my question. How do we address silos when we want to align towards shared goals and interdependencies? Not easy. Um, so there's a sense of identity, right? If, if Department A and Department B think of themselves as Department A and Department B, um, then they're going to need something higher that they both sort of believe in to be able to have that conversation. That's a little bit of a little bit of a starting point. Um, if they depend on one another, they, they certainly have a reason to want to talk about those things. And I'd hope that maybe they could create some kind of shared OKR. So that might be one strategy. You'd have to see you know, are the conditions there for that to work? But that's just one idea that comes to mind. Is that helpful? I think so. Mero had a really interesting comment over in the chat. She said, uh, for over 18 months of listening in and talking to people all over Europe, tying in OKRs in any form to yearly results and or compensation was always leading to sabotage of the team's <laughs> achievement over their objectives slowing down the orgs and increased friction between teams and departments. And I'm sorry, people kept chatting below. Yeah. They kept going yeah. up. I'm like, no, no, no. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, yep. That's about decomposition, uh, breaking down the mega goals into the long-term vision into yearly goals and quarterly goals. So mm. isn't it all about decomposition? Oh, mm. you have a lot of questions tonight. The chat is really chatty. <laughs> Um, I, so I think you're talking about vertical alignment is what it, what it feels like a little bit, right? So if we have, so let's just take an example. So if I have a quarterly product goal and I'm a team that works on a product, uh, I may have sprint goals if I'm a scrum team. So I may break the big goal into some smaller goals and I may take the goal and break it into ideas that I think could be ways to get at the goals. Um, so if that's what you mean by decomposition, I'd agree with those statements. Um, I'm seeing one from Heidi again. Is the particular cadence at which we recommend setting OKRs? Uh, so it depends. So Leon, thanks for making me hungry. I haven't eaten yet, but the family has. So Leon, Leon's having pasta. So um, regularity, yeah. <laughs> hey man, these chat things are coming up. They're distracting. So um, so we do. So the place I'm coaching right now. Um, they actually made the decision before I got there, but I kind of like it. Um, they started bottom up because their main thing they wanted to do is start empowering the teams and they've shifted from project to product. So they're, they're helping teams become product focused and they're setting quarterly product goals. Uh, I think that's a great way to get started because it's something people can kind of wrap their heads around and try it out and learn a little more quickly. I think if you go to a month, that's just too soon. Um, and a year sometimes is a little too long. Um, if you're going to do goals at multiple levels, the higher up you get, generally the further out it gets. So you're going to see annual goals for like VP levels, right? And then maybe at the highest level, C level, you might see strategic OKRs that could be two, three, five years out, something like that. Does that help? Yes. I'm going to close know. it down with after one last question. Uh, this is... Um, how can you be flexible with OKRs without losing focus? Say more. 
I can't, unless Hamal would like to add on to that. That was the question. No, I know. Oh. I don't have an answer. I need more info. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, figure out because the thing is organizations start with OKRs, um, yep. but they get tied in so much into OKRs that, uh, you know, with feedback from folks around them, uh, sometimes those OKRs are unachievable because they're too aspirational. Uh, yep. So then they end up splitting into two parties, one party that says, hey, we need to stick to OKRs because we need to get to the target outcomes. And the other says, we need to be a little bit flexible because we need to give ourselves room to experiment, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, how to, how to walk that thin line uh, to be flexible enough and open-minded uh, and experiment, but still stay aligned to the, uh, to the OKR. Okay, okay. So, so you're, um, interesting. Sometimes chocolate and peanut butter actually go together. So mm -hmm. in this case, I'd say, I'd say the experimentation can actually help Right, so if you can run short experiments, and this is where I think if you put some leading indicators in, it can be really helpful. So you can be, the, what, what do they say in Lean Start? The, the speed of learning is your competitive advantage. So I think when you're doing that, you also wanna see some kind of results. So even if, even if you're doing, let's say the thing you're working on is something you're gonna to release to your customers and it's gonna be a while before you do that. Even if you can do some internal usability testing or something like that, you can, you can gain some indications that this thing's gonna be effective or it's not. And so I think you can experiment and you can learn in this way without any, anything punitive and still work towards the goals. So I don't know that they have to be at odds, I guess is my position. Okay. 